Bien. Eh... So we have initiated a worldwide campaign to take on Coca-Cola. And this campaign has come about because of Coca-Cola's systematic violation of human rights. So I want to take you through just a few of the events that brought us to this point where we are launching this campaign. To begin with, you have to have an understanding that the entire dirty war that's taking place in Colombia that's being perpetrated by paramilitary groups is being directed by the government and the multinational corporations that are present in Colombia. And fundamentally, the, 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 the drive behind that is to create the conditions that they need to create in order to establish free trade agreements and have Colombia be a part of them. So to pave the way for trade agreements like the FTAA, <coughs> they basically have to do away with social uh, human rights organizations, labor organizations that would resist those kinds of domination, uh, resist that kind of capitalism. Paramilitary groups are basically a government an extension of, 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 of the government to really try and wipe out all these civil society organizations, these socially responsible groups. And those uh, paramilitary groups have been around for a long time in Colombia, but they've grown, they've been fed through all the money that's flowing into Colombia around the, the United States Plan Colombia foreign policy. And so those <coughs> paramilitary groups were trained by the military, but then the question is, who's training the military? That is coming out of people who are trained in the School of Americas in Fort Benning, Georgia. So on the 5th of December of 1996, Isidro Segundo Gil was assassinated, and it took place inside the bottling factory of Coca-Cola and was perpetrated by paramilitary groups. Luis Adolfo Cardona was another compañero, a member of the union, who had to leave because he was threatened, his life was threatened by paramilitaries. He left Colombia and now lives in Chicago because he cannot return to his country for fear of being murdered by paramilitary groups. And on that very same day, that 5th of December, they burned down the local, the Union Hall in that area. The very next day, the paramilitary group entered the Coca-Cola factory, rounded up workers, and told them that they would have to renounce the Union or face assassination. Forty-eight members of the executive committee of the Union were displaced from that area, basically had to flee the area because of those events. And in that fashion, they basically wiped out that local. That same year, 1996, five members of the union were arrested, put in jail, and the charges were uh, charges of terrorism, and they were lodged basically uh, as stemming from terrorism against Coca-Cola. They spent six months in jail before they were finally released and declared innocent by the uh, Colombian courts. But the Coca-Cola company was asking for 20 years of prison plus $500, 500 million dollars uh, of uh, the, the Colombian currency as a charge, as a fine. And in that same uh, time frame, in the town of Cucuta, another active union member was kidnapped by paramilitary groups. So he was kidnapped, he was driven around the city blindfolded to an unknown place where they unblindfolded him and showed him a picture that had uh, come out in a, in a local newspaper about a protest that had taken place outside of a Coca-Cola bottling plant. And he was told that if those kinds of protests continued, his life would be in jeopardy, they would take his life. And there are over 65 union members 
who have basically received death threats from that same paramilitary group. And so I'm bringing it up to the present day, not a single person has been arrested or even detained in any of these incidents of violence. No action has been taken to investigate or find the perpetrators. So the events that we were just talking about, plus many, many more, were the impetus for this whole international, worldwide campaign to take on Coca-Cola, because the events were going unrecognized by the government and not responded to, and this is the moment that we've reached now, taking it out of Colombia, past the borders. So last year, there were three unveilings of this campaign in an effort to really get the word out of what is happening and make everybody aware of the events that are taking place in relation to Coca-Cola in Colombia. And out of those unveilings, those, those announcements of this campaign, there were two very clear demands, two very clear goals that came out of them. The first step is to declare a boycott against all products made by Coca-Cola in every part of the world. So along with that international boycott is the second part, which is... Uh, focusing on investment in Coca-Cola so that anybody who does business with Coca-Cola, has stock in Coca-Cola, gives money to Coca-Cola, starts taking their money out of the company. And that is the basis of our worldwide campaign against Coca-Cola. So all of these events were focused around justice and around looking for reparations and accountability on the part of Coca-Cola. We want to know who was the mastermind, who were the brains behind all these very well-planned out intimidation tactics. So who masterminded the imprisonment of union activists, the entering the union uh, bottling plant to round up union activists, all the intimidation and death threats that have taken place. Who is coordinating this and who's carrying it out? We want to know who's behind it. And beyond just knowing who it is, we want to actually bring them to justice and get some justice in these cases so that they are held accountable for their actions. And when we talk about getting reparations, what we're looking for is the Coca-Cola company as a multinational company and the Colombian government making reparations to the family members of the survivors, excuse me, the family members of the people who've been killed and to the organization the union that suffered so much under these, these intimidation tactics. So we have the boycott, we have this international campaign and the divestment, but there's another piece to this which is a legal component to what we're doing. We've submitted a civil suit against Coca-Cola in a Florida courtroom um, under a long-standing U.S. law, alien torts claim. So there are four bases for this civil suit. And the first one was the murder of Isidro Segundo Gil. The second one was the jailing of all the union members. The third one, the kidnapping of Jorge Leal in the city of Cucuta. And the fourth one are the continuing death threats against my life. So, in response to that court case, Coca-Cola has basically put together a countersuit, which is going ahead in Colombia, um, and they're doing it through one of their subsidiary, their contract uh, companies that does bottling for them. The, the, the demand that they have placed on the union is that the union, in a public forum, for example, national newspaper, declare that Coca-Cola was in no way involved with the actions that took place, and they've moreover asked for $500 million uh, in the currency of Colombia to, as basically, for defamation, saying that their name has been defamed through these, uh, these tactics. It was our hope that by pursuing the lawsuit, by pursuing a, a global boycott, a divestment campaign, that Coca-Cola would take note of what was going on and back off of their policies of consistent human rights violations in Colombia.
This past August 22nd, there was an attempt on my life by a paramilitary group in the town where I was living. Two men drove up on a motorcycle and shot repeated shots, uh, fired repeated gunshots into the car that I was driving. Through sheer luck, I, I, I escaped without injury. So, uh, and the following September 9th, which is known in Colombia as the day that ce celebrates and commemorates human rights, was the same day that Coca-Cola decided to par do a partial shutdown of nine plants in Colombia. And what they did was they put the workers of those factories into hotels that were guarded by armed guards and wouldn't even let their union representatives go in and talk with them about what was happening and what was going on. And in the hotels, each worker was pressured to renounce their union under the threat of being fired. And, and 400 of them lost their jobs as a result of what took place. And for those that resisted the pressure to leave, the company has requested permission from the authorities to fire 200 more workers. All of the actions that, were take, that took place that day are in complete and flagrant violation of Colombian labor law. So you can see, clearly they haven't backed off of their incredibly aggressive tactics to try and break the union. The next day, the uh, son of one of the union leaders was kidnapped. Uh, Limberto Carranza is the name of this union leader, and he is actually a leader at the national level. His son was 14, uh, excuse me, 15 years old. He was kidnapped at 11 a.m., taken to an unknown location and tortured. While his son was being tortured, they called the union leader that they were targeting and told him that he had to leave the city or he would be assassinated. He, the uh, son, was basically released by his, uh, from, from captivity at, at 4 p.m. that day in very serious condition. He was recognized by a passerby and brought to the police. So these are events that took place even after all of the tactics that have amounted to really try and take on Coca-Cola as a multinational company. So, in going through the process of unveiling this campaign at the various different unveiling stops, it became clear that Coca-Cola has violated these kinds of human and labor rights all over the world and never been held accountable for it. So in Iran and Turkey, Coca-Cola was a major player in undermining the entire labor movement. In uh, India, there are examples of Coca-Cola entering communities and appropriating their water well, their fresh water sources, and then prohibiting uh, the community from drawing the water that should rightfully be theirs. And you should all know about the uh, murders of Guatemalan labor leaders that took place in 1984, which was also connected to Coca-Cola. And so the Coca-Cola was active in all of the anti-revolutionary movements that took place in Guatemala, Nicaragua, and El Salvador. So Coca-Cola was also a very active player in the nationwide strikes in Venezuela. There are basically industry-driven strikes that were trying to oust uh, the President Chavez. And that's not even to mention the racial discrimination that Coca-Cola has taken out, uh, basically carried out on a systematic level in the United States and their involvement in discriminating against uh, victims of AIDS in Africa. 
esos son algunos de los casos. And those are just a number of the, the, the many skeletons in Coke's closet that have basically just been kept under wraps, been kept very quiet, and they've never been held accountable for. And that's why I'm here. I'm here in Portland, in the United States, on this tour to bring the message to you about what is taking place with Coca-Cola and to ask for your support. So it's incredibly important that right now the message about this campaign, about the Coke boycott, really get diffused and start getting out there, one person talking to another, because we are running a risk of having our union being completely exterminated in Colombia. Any participation or protest that you can bring to bear against Coca-Cola is welcome because that is essentially the one thing that, that, that keeps us alive and that provides us the, the room to continue organizing and growing stronger in Colombia. And Coca-Cola is very well aware of the fact that I'm here right now. So am I afraid to go back to Colombia? Yes. Yeah, I am afraid to go back to Colombia. But at the same time, I understand the responsibilities that I have, that any Colombian man or woman who loves their country has to go forward. And that will mean that I will go back to Colombia. Um, and I'll take on all the risk that that involves.